Hi students, good evening. I welcome you all for this Biology Detailed Solutions Part 2 Mock Test 5. So today we are going to have the next phase of the 45 questions. We are going to discuss the solutions and we are going to have a nice interaction like how are we deciding like which is the right answer or not. Let us not waste time, we will go to the session. So now we will start with the discussion. Now you can see the first question here. Yes, the first question is the malarial parasite is polygenetic. Digenetic, monogenetic or monomorphic. Okay. So, among this, which is the right one? So, we can see here the right answer of malarial parasite. Now, we all know that malarial parasite, it is going to have two hosts. Okay. So, to complete its life cycle, like it is going to have one of the hosts as humans. Another host, it is going to have what? Uh, it is the uh, the mosquito, right? So we call that as the digenetic. Okay. So here you can see this one minute. So we can see here it is going to be digenetic. So how are we going to say it is uh, digenetic? Like malarial parasite. Like when you talk about it, like it is a digenetic because. It is its life cycle is going to get completed with two hosts. Okay, one will be the mosquito, the other one will be the human. Okay, so the primary host uh, where it is going to have a definitive or a primary host for the malarial parasite, wherein the sexual phase of the uh, parasite it is going to get uh, completed. Yes, yes, very good, Nilambari. You have given the right answer. So when you look into the Thing, the sexual phase will be getting completed okay where it is happening it is it should have two phases right it should be one asexual other sexual phase so it requires two phase uh, like two hosts to complete its life cycle okay so that is why humans and it is going to use the mosquito as the other host so it is a digenetic we will go to the next question the pH of the digestive juices within the human small intestine is between 7.5 and 8.5. This environment is slightly, this environment is slightly basic, acidic, neutral, none of these. So when we say pH, so in a pH scale when you take, okay, the neutral pH is what? It is going to be 7. Anything less than 7 is acidic and anything more than 7 is going to be alkaline. That we are aware of it. So, when I talk about the pH, we are in turn talking about the hydrogen ion concentration. So, as you see the pH is going to go less, there is going to be high concentration of hydrogen ion. As once when the pH is going to increase, what is going to happen? The concentration of hydrogen ion is going to become very very less. So, this concept we have to know. So, we have to know the pH of the digestive juices within small intestine. They are saying it is 7.5 and 8.5 which means what? They are actually basic. Okay. So, pH refers to the relative concentration of H plus ions in a solution. So, when you take the low pH values, okay, that indicate there is high levels of H plus ion which is very acidic. Now, what about high pH values that indicate the low hydrogen ion which means they are basic or alkaline. So probably the small intestine it is actually having the secretions from pancreas okay as well as from the bile as well as it is going to have the succus entricus that is the small intestine secretion itself. So all these contribute for the alkanity that is it is having the pH more alkaline. So that is the reason because it has to 
first encounter the corrosive effect of the HCl which is poured into the duodenum. So, we have what are the Brunner's gland, we have the copious secretion uh, which is given by the pancreatic juice which is very alkaline we say as well as the bile all will tend to neutralize the acidic chyme which is trying to enter the duodenum. Yes, so I hope you will uh, know this concept. So, that is the answer. Okay, yes, very good Neelambari, you have given the right answer. We will go to the next question. Now, we see that there is something called phlox. The phlox produced in the secondary treatment plant of the sewage comprises of algae and fungi, only algae, viruses, bacteria and fungi. So, when you see the phlox actually, they are masses of what? Those bacteria, okay, which is associated with those fungal filaments like a mesh like structure okay so that is what we mean by flux so what you need to know here okay so what you need to know here yes they are in a sludge structure so where we have uh, uh, what is called they help in more aerobic uh, decomposition and uh, as well as the filament help in trapping those uh, particles actually so, when they are put in the secondary sewage tank. So, those flocks which are produced there in the secondary uh, treatment plant. Okay. So, they consist of what? They have more of uh, uh, what you call the bacteria and fungi. So, the primary effluent okay, was passed into the large aeration tanks with constant agitation and the air was pumped okay, into it. So, this allowed the vigorous growth of useful aerobic microbes like bacteria and fungi to form a mesh like flux. Okay, so the microbes they consume a lot of organic matter in the effluent and it is reduced as what we call the bot. So, more the biological oxygen demand, more is going to be what? It is going to be the uh, what you call more the pollutant the uh, fluid is. Okay, so that is the answer okay okay just one minute yeah yeah so the answer is bacteria and fungi yes neelambari very good you have given the uh, right answer excellent okay so now we will see the next question so during the blood typing okay the agglutination indicates that okay during uh, so during the blood typing uh, agglutination it indicates that the RBC, okay, it indicates the RBC carries certain antigens, right? Plasma contains certain antigens, okay, and RBC carries certain antibodies. Plasma contains certain antibodies. Now, when you take the blood typing agglutination, what is agglutination? So, agglutination is nothing but it is a antigen antibody reaction, okay, it is the antigen antibody uh, reaction that we are seeing okay and so here you should understand that usually there should not be any agglutination okay the agglutination if it is going to happen then it is something very serious that is what you need to first basically understand normally in a living body or rbc whatever will not agglutinate because it is according to the landsteiner's law if you are thorough about it Okay, we have the Landsteiner law. What did the Landsteiner law propose? They say that if a particular antigen is present on the surface of the RBC, the corresponding uh, antibody must be absent in the plasma. Suppose if I have A antigen on my RBC surface, then I will not have anti A in my plasma. Instead, I will have anti B. So, if both are going to be present in the same person, then agglutination will occur. So, this is the basis for the blood typing agglutination. So, what will be the 
exact thing you can see that on the surface of the rbc it is going to have those antigens okay so if it is going to be a antigen then your a group if you are going to have b antigen then your b blood group if if they have both the antigen then they are ab if there is no antigen then we call them as o group okay see look into us as i explained according to the langstainer's law what is that like if you have uh, say a blood group it's anti b if it's b it is anti a if you are a and b you don't have any antibody that's why they are universal recipient same way also here also in o group there is no antigen whereas we have both anti a and anti b they are universal donors so agglutination is a process where the antibodies they bind to specific antigens okay they will form that large insoluble complexes which render them harmless and facilitate their destruction by other immune system so the rbc will have those four specific antigen like antigen a b or ab on the cell surface and during the blood grouping that is the typing what we do in our laboratory the added antibodies will bind to them and agglutinate okay so the answer is excellent nilambari good it is the rbc that carries the certain antigens so that is why that agglutination takes place okay we'll go to the next question okay the next question here is the statement tiger is in the apex of food chain indicates the options are the tiger has many enemies tiger has maximum biomass tiger is omnivorous tiger is dependent upon a large number of herbivores so like when you take in a food chain okay you have a various uh, what you call the trophic levels so every uh, trophic level the energy is transferred like we know the 10% energy that is being transferred so it starts from the producers and just it goes with the primary consumer the secondary consumer and all that so this tiger constitutes the trier secondary consumers that means it is going to feed on the herbivores so they are carnivores actually so the tiger is actually the top of the consumer like when you look into it in a food chain like it keep eating on all the primary uh, consumer that is the herbivores and all that okay that which feeds on the green plants okay so thus indirectly it is also linked with a tree that is why the tiger is uh, dependent upon a large number of herbivores yes very good shrivarsan welcome please start uh, answering the session okay welcome so this is the tiger which is in the apex of the food chain so that is the reason okay we'll go to the next question the correct sequence among the following is palazoic mesozoic cenozoic or it is mesozoic archaeozoic and proterozoic or the option c they have given whether it is the paleozoic archaeozoic and cenozoic or whether it is archaeozoic paleozoic and proterozoic see the time span is actually they have isolated into three geographical okay the three geographical uh, or the geologic exact term we should not use geographical i'm sorry it is geological so it is the geological period so it comes from paleozoic then the mesozoic and then we have what is called the cenozoic so usually they say that the age of earth okay so the age of earth is around some 4 billion years ago the history of uh, the thing has been divided into four eras okay they are nothing but we have the proterozoic okay and then we have the paleozoic okay then we have the mesozoic and then it is the cenozoic so that is the correct sequence ma okay so nilambari the option is what it is the the one which you have given yes excellent very good okay so this is the right option okay yes we'll go to the next question yeah very interesting so mostly when it comes with uh, human system like we'll be very interested to know what question they've asked so i am also just looking forward the human kidney so we're going to talk about the kidney the option here is responsible for the storage of nutrients such as glycogen concentrates the urine by actively transporting water out of filtrate produces more dilute urine when the collecting ducts become less permeable to water responds to anti diuretic hormone by increasing the urine output now uh, children you should know like 
they have given so much of options here and we are going to find out which is the right one. Now C first is responsible for storage of nutrients such as glycogen? No, because glycogen gets stored or deposited up where? In the liver. Concentrates the urine by actively transporting out the filtrate? No, so this cannot be the option. Now then what happens? It is going to produce more dilute urine when the collecting duct is become less permeable to water. Now we all know the filter when it gets filtered we call that as the filtrate which is an ultra filtrate. Now it is going to pass through all the tubules. So when it is coming to the collecting duct what happens? So here every after coming to DCT you know it will be hypotonic only here it is isotonic then here and all it is hypotonic ok. Now what happens now? If the filtration is very concentrated and the filtrate is very hypertonic, okay, now what will happen? Then the urine will be very concentrated. Suppose if the collecting ducts becomes less permeable to water, then what will happen? Then there will be more dilute urine. So to have a concentrated urine, it should be more permeable. If it is less permeable, then there will be dilute urine. Okay, then it responds to antidiuretic hormone by increasing. No, when ADH comes into play, the urine output will be decreased. So, which is the right option? Yes, it produces more dilute urine. I hope you will all understand. Because there is no ADH, if there is no uh, water needed there, what will happen? It will become less permeable. I hope you all remember those aquaporins which I taught you. So, those aquaporin water channels may not be there. So, there will be no water reabsorption. Yes, very good. Huh? So that is the reason. Yes, Sri Vatsav, please start to respond. We have here another nice interesting question. They have given a diagram. Okay, given below is the diagrammatic uh, section. Uh, view of the ovary. Identify the parts labeled as A, B and C. So here you are seeing a structure of the ovary. So they wanted us to know like what is A, B and C. Children, first thing that like, you need to understand like uh, just before the birth, what happens we have those uh, what is called many ugonia are formed like millions of ugonia like all will undergo those mitotic division and they get arrested up in the prophase uh, stage 1. Okay, so they undergo uh, various division and they just get arrested up in the prophase stage. Now what will happen there will be many uh, what you call those uh, cells which are called the primary follicles which will be present there. Now they will be arrested up in the uh, uh, what you call in the prophase 1 stage. Now when will be this uh, meiotic division will be completed that is the first meiotic division. Like what will happen just before that uh, when the girl is going to attain the puberty what is going to happen the first meiotic division is going to get completed. There will be release of one secondary oocyte and then one first polar body. So that is where the first uh, what is that the first meiotic division gets completed. So what you are seeing you are seeing lot of follicles there which is developing up. So what you are seeing here is the tertiary follicle. So this is a primary follicle the secondary follicle and then you can see what you are seeing here is the tertiary follicle. Okay now you can see here next what happens after that one big follicle like what is going to happen that one uh, uh, follicle. Uh, uh, so what you are seeing here so you can see the follicle here. Now what happens once when the follicle is formed you now what will happen they will rupture out and release them. So that one mature follicle we call it as the graphene follicle ok. So tertiary follicle the graphene follicle actually we have vesicular follicle also. So we have the graphene follicle and then we have what is released out yes it is the ovum and what you are seeing here after this is released out this entire area is going to get accumulated with some cells those cells are called luiten cells ok they are called the luiten cells and these luiten cells are going to actually uh, produce the give that yellowish color and they are called the corpus luteum so they are called the corpus luteum and they are going to release what they are going to produce the progesterone so corpus luteum job is to produce progesterone so what is the option here so the option here is actually the graphene follicle okay the answer is actually c it is graphene follicle ovum and corpus luteum okay next we'll go to this the acellular forms of life could have originated around 1000 mia. What is this mia? Million years ago. 1000 uh, that is 500 mia, 2000 mia, 3000 mia. 
So the first non-cellular or the acellular forms of life, they could have originated somewhere around 3 billion years back. Okay. So probably they would have been the giant molecules. Okay. They would have been the giant molecules, RNA, protein, polysaccharides, etc. So these capsules reproduce their molecules. So the first cellular form of life, it, it, it did not come up probably somewhere around 2000 million ago. So they say that it is a single cell and all life forms were in water environment only. So it was probably from the 3 to 3 point. So that is where it comes around 3000 mia. Okay, it's not 2000 and 2000 less we have not found any acellular forms. So they said it is 3000 and 3000 plus only the first acellular or the non-cellular forms of life have originated. Okay, so that is the uh, right answer. Okay, ma, Neelambari uh, and uh, Srivatsa. We will go to another interesting question here, metagenesis. So what is metagenesis? The metagenesis is actually seen in Cycon or Oblia, Ascaris, Lumbricoids or Periplanata Americana. So what is metagenesis? It is very characteristics of Nidarians. So we know first you should know what is metagenesis. The metagenesis is a form of is a reproduction cycle in an organism where there is going to be alternate between sexual and asexual generation. So the best example we can give with the Nidarians actually. So the life cycle of Oblia. So the Oblia is the right answer where there will be alternate asexual and sexual generations. So you have those asexual what you call the polyp and then we have the sexual medusa. So we will be uh, seeing in the case. So both the forms are deployed actually. Okay. So Nidarians exhibit two basic body forms. You call them polyp and medusa. So the former is a sessile and cylindrical form like hydra, adamsia and all. Whereas the latter will be like umbrella shape where they will be floating like a jellyfish. So those Nidarians which uh, exist in both forms, okay, uh, exhibit the alteration of generation that is both sexual and asexual. That is polyps produce medusa asexually, medusa will form the polyps sexually. So example, best example is what? It is oblia, okay. So next we will go to another question. Yeah, this is a most interesting, come a very nice question. The largest known human gene is gene for dystrophin, the gene for ADA which is adenosine deaminase that enzyme for the activation of those T lymphocytes, gene for cystic fibrosis the T CTFR, gene for phenylalanine hydroxylase. So they have said that the DMD that is the dystrophin gene is supposed to be the largest, the largest human gene because it is going to provide the instruction for making a protein called dystrophin. Okay, that protein is actually very much important for the skeletal muscle movement huh? and this dystrophin is actually a, a rod like shape a protein where we see the dystrophin. Okay, now the role of the dystrophin is actually it will connect to the cytoskeleton of a muscle fiber and it is that is it is going to connect the what you call the cytoskeleton particularly the filaments and then it is going to attach it to the extracellular matrix. Okay, so that is very very important. So this dystrophin associated complex protein, okay, what we see is actually um, supposed to be very important because any uh, mutation or any uh, genetic related issues can come up and it can result in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a commonest form of muscular dystrophy we see. So the answer is what? It is the gene for dystrophin. So the average gene consists of around some 3000 bases. The size can vary greatly. It is the largest known human gene being dystrophin which has got 2.4 million bases. So with, but with dystrophin the other possible things to remember connects the cytoskeleton with that of the extracellular matrix. Okay that you need to know and it's very much very very important particularly in the skeletal muscle as well as even in the cardiac muscle also. So they are present in the muscles actually. Okay so that you need to know. Okay. So we will go to the next question. What is true about rheumatoid arthritis? Okay, it is a neurological disorder. It causes inflammation of joints. It's a type of autoimmune disease. Now, just look into this picture where I want to tell you rheumatoid arthritis actually as a student of biology or a student of medicine, what basic thing that you need to know, it is something called a crippling disease. It is going to cause crippling like it can bring about these deformities. So it is a crippling disease. Second thing, it is not a neurological disorder. 
probably the body own antibodies okay the immune system they are going to attack these tissues particularly the joints and it is going to bring about a destruction of the joint space resulting in arthritis which is inflammation of the joint that we call it as the type of autoimmune disease the rheumatoid arthritis so this uh, inflammation is going to be for a prolonged period where it is going to erode the joint surface and bone deform bone erosion with the deformities okay so you can also see that there is inflammation as well it is a, so what is the right answer yes students you are right the answer is it is going to be both b and c okay so we give them a classic uh, set of drugs that will have an anti inflammatory effect as well as it has to suppress their own immune system so that they can overcome the disease so rheumatoid arthritis okay okay yes very good students yes please do chat so we have the next set of question the stirred tank bio reactors have been designed for addition of preservatives to the product purification of the product ensuring anaerobic uh, conditions in the cultured vessel availability of oxygen throughout the process so we have those stirred uh, uh, what you call the tank bio reactors okay so what is the main purpose is to ensure the oxygen mass transfer so we have that oxygen ma mass transfer is actually the function of many variables okay so here that stirrer no it will particularly provide what you call that even mixing and oxygen okay availability throughout the bio reactor so you can see the uh, picture here see you are having the the picture where there is a stirrer here so what it is going to do the stirred tank bio reactors okay it has got that cylindrical or a curved uh, curvature to facilitate the mixing of those nutrients so it is going to continuously constantly supply those oxygen okay throughout the process so the presence of this rotator which is there okay so what it is going to do at uh, the blade or shaft that will facilitate the even mixing and the oxygen available throughout the bio reactor so the answer here is it is the availability of oxygen throughout the process so that is the right answer okay now next question comes here when selection acts to eliminate both extremes from an array of phenotypes the frequency of intermediate type which is already present in more gets increased this type of selection is called disruptive selection b option gives directional uh, selection and stabilizing selection or non directional selection so we are going to find which of them is right yes very good neelambari shrivatsav yes please do post the answers good so when you look into this uh, thing we have what is called a stabilizing selection directional selection and disruptive selection so here they are saying that when selection acts to eliminate the two extremes okay there will be an array of phenotypes okay so they will the frequency of those intermediate which is already present will get increased so such a thing is called the stabilizing selection okay what it is going to do in stabilizing selection or normalizing selection which is the other name okay when selection acts to eliminate both the extreme okay so what is going to happen that intermediate phenotype which is already most common that gets uh, increased so that is the right answer whereas in directional it will favor one extreme that is directional if uh, it is going to favor both the extreme then we call it as disruptive which is bimodal distribution we say so the right answer here is what ma the stabilizing selection okay okay we'll go to the next question next question is very very simple the 60th question here so what is the 60th question they are giving here yes the thalamus we'll see the options the thalamus is base of a flower the base of a ovary modification of pollen modification of petal now when you take the base of the uh, flower actually which is at the tip of the pedicel that swells up to form that cone of structure which we call it as the thalamus so you can see that uh, like when you see the floral part that part which swells up okay and then that tip fra, that is at the tip like where it starts up so the pedicel so there you come up across this swollen structure so it consists of nodes and highly reduced internodes also so the broadened base of the flower which lies at the tip of the pedicel is called the torus or thalamus or receptacle so what do you mean by the thalamus see that swollen part okay so this portion we call it as the thalamus the base of the flower 
Yes, very good, Sri Vatsav, Nilambari, good. We will go to the next interesting question. Yes, the contraction of the ventricle and the heart begins by command from caudate tendine, SA node, Purkinje fibers and AV node. So, like when it comes to from where is the information coming and how are these ventricles going to respond. So, when you look into this picture, see this is called the SA node, the AV node, the bundle of his. Okay, we have the bundle, we have the right bundle, the left bundle and then we have the Purkinje fibers. Okay, so the chordae tendine are these uh, say the muscles which is going to make taut the valve during the contraction. So, that will not be the option. The Purkinje fibers is the one like uh, the ramifications as you see. So, that cannot be or the AV node. So, which is called the pacemaker of the heart? Yes, it is the SA node. Yes, very good children, it is the SA node because why we call the SA node as the pacemaker? Because it can initiate its own rhythm, it can go on its own phase. That is, that is what we call it is around 70 to 80 beats per minute and uh, you can see that it can generate the maximum number of action potential that is 70 to 75 per minute okay and is responsible for initiating and maintaining that rhythmic contraction of the heart so whatever the impulse which starts here it is going to pass through the interatrial tract reaches the av node and through all this bundle it is going to pass the information so this electric current that which is traveled to the ventricle that is which it makes a contraction of the ventricle so that is why we call the sa node as the pacemaker of the heart yes excellent student you have given the right answer Yes, so I have told it is not the Purkinje fibers nor the chordae tendine because chordae tendine has to keep the valves in position. So, that is the role of chordae tendine, it does not have any role with the conducting system. Okay. Yeah, we will come to this concept in increasing order of organizational complexity, which one of the following is the correct sequence species, population, community, ecosystem, or it is a population, community, species, ecosystem population, ecosystem, species and community. The last option is species, population, ecosystem, community. So, when you look into an organization, now you have to know that the species, okay, the species are the one which is going to resemble one another in that particular group like in terms of morphology, anatomy, physiology, biochemical characters that are potentially interbreed. That is the characteristic of species. Now, the aggregation of these species of the same species they form what is called the population in a given same time or on a particular area okay now what will be the next step after the population so the biotic uh, all the population whatever the biotic uh, thing the living organism in a population that constitute the biotic community okay the biotic community is an assemblage of what all the interdependent okay it is interdependent whereas what about the ecosystem it is self-sufficient it is self-regulating it knows to manage itself so it is the interaction between the uh, between the biotic and the abiotic environment okay and there is exchange of materials also so that is where the ecosystem comes so what is the right answer yes it goes from species then the population then comes the community then comes the ecosystem okay so, I think uh, Sri Vatsav, now you are able to follow. See, species, okay, they are group of organisms that are alike, okay. So, those alike, alike populations, like you have a tiger population, you have a deer population. So, all that, that species on the whole, like they have variety of population. Many population together will form a community, like say a forest or all these different communities that will form one ecosystem. You are able to follow Sri Vatsav? Okay, I will go to the next question. Coming to the next question, what is true about the Bt toxin? Okay, the Bt protein exists as active toxin in the bacillus. The activated toxin enters the ovaries of the pest to sterilize it and thus prevents its multiplication. The concerned bacillus has antitoxins. The inactive protoxin gets converted into an active form in the insect gut. Okay, so now first you need to understand this concept that what we call the Bt that is the bacillus thuringiens. It is a gram positive, uh, uh, what do you call, it is a gram positive uh, bacteria, okay. Later I will just put on with it. Now it has got an, a very important thing that it produces crystals during the sporulation, 
okay now these crystals okay these crystal proteins they are actually inactive protoxins okay and once when a certain set of insects they are going to just uh, uh, take it up these in ingested crystals they dissolve in that alkaline condition and they get activated as a toxin okay so now what happens the, they'll bind with the receptors which is there in the midgut of that particular insect's epithelial cell and it is going to form the pore formation there is going to be large uh, osmotic lysis leading to the death of the insect so that is the basic concept so what is going to happen that inactive protoxin is getting converted into the active form because of the alkalinity that is provided in the insect's gut let me read this so that you can understand the bacillus thuringiensis forms protein crystals during a particular phase of their growth which i already told you it is called the sporulation so these crystals contain a toxic in insecticidal protein yeah we know that it is around some 130k dalton protein okay protoxins actually they are so actually the bt toxin protein exists as an inactive protoxin but once an insect ingest the inactive toxin it is converted to the active form of toxin because of that alkaline ph of the gut so that is very very important which will solubilize those crystals now those crystals okay those activated toxin binds to the surface of the midgut epithelium because they have the receptors there and creates pores that cause cell swelling and lysis and eventually cause death of that insects but it is not harmful to humans other mammals birds fish other insects so specific bt the toxin gene was isolated from bacillus thuringiensis and is incorporated into several crop plants particularly bt cotton which is very 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 famous okay yes very good nilambari you have given the right answer excellent ma okay we'll come for the next very interesting question here what is db is a standard abbreviation used for the quantitative expression of the density of bacteria in a medium yes the particular pollutant the dominant bacillus in a culture a certain pesticide so when it comes to db i think hope if you are very good in physics you will put up the answer yes db is nothing but it's an abbreviation what we call for decibels the unit that we express so okay so that unwanted uh, sound uh, what we call that is the noise so usually they say that uh, uh, the sound that is range what you can hear will be less than that 100 decibel so according to one uh, work where we have done a study on noise research they have said they have said that uh, more than 100 more than 100 even 120 more than that we consider as the noise so generally sound anything less than that 80 80 to 100 decibel is a sound but more than that it's a noise like jet plane or it's there is a bomb explosion so any traffic uh, what we are so that you have various grading of those decibels okay so beyond after a point what will happen there will be damage to your inner ear so that is where you need to follow so what is that it is a particular pollutant it's expressing a particular pollutant what pollutant it is expressing the noise pollutant okay so that you need to know okay children yes sri vatsav nilambari yes please post your answers yeah here comes an interesting question here the nicotiana silvestris flowers only during long days and nicotina tabacum flowers only during short days okay if raised in the laboratory under different photo periods they can be induced to flower at the same time and can be cross fertilized to produce self fertile offspring what is the best reason for considering nicotinia silvestris and nicotina tabacum to be separate species so they are telling it's long day flowers short day flowers okay and how you can make it up a fertile offspring first option they cannot interbreed in nature they are reproductively distinct they are physiologically distinct they are morphologically distinct so how are we going to make up see among these questions like when you talk about the silvestris and the tabacum they have two different photo periods as you all observe so each species they will have their own photo period and we all know that plants cannot interbreed because what you call uh, like what you call they cannot interbreed if it is going to be of some other species now the term species evolved from the word specific means only those groups of plants or animals come under one species which can be interbred and they can produce that fertile offspring naturally okay now when you talk about the tobacco and silvestris they cannot produce flowers naturally they cannot produce flowers naturally they have different photo periods hence they don't belong to the same species okay 
so they cannot interbreed in nature so that is the right answer even though they are uh, nicotinica silvestris and tabacum they are of different species where they cannot be interbred in nature okay so that is the right answer yes come on nilambari shri watson yes here comes another nice question the swiss cheese is ripened by propanicum uh, propani bacterium shermanae it's a very direct question okay penicillum rofotai penicillum camembertae streptococcus lactis yes students yes it's a very very easy question yes it's a very direct question very very basic what is that the swiss cheese i hope you will remember swiss cheese usually in the tom and jerry you know that jerry used to carry this cheese which will have those holes okay it will always go and irritate the tom it will have those cheese in his hands yes you can see the cheese here okay which the jerry likes you can see here right so those holes which have been made okay the swiss cheese is characterized by those large holes okay which is formed due to the amount of carbon dioxide that is released probably because of the propanio bacterium shermanae proponium rofotae is involved in ri ripening of the rofifort cheese then camembert uh, cheese is uh, ripened by penicillin camembertae so that rofifort cheese will have that greenish color like so that is probably because of the penicillin rofotae whereas this penicillin camembertae uh, is for that particular cheese the camembert cheese actually they say france is very famous for having so many different kinds of cheese which has been for so many years back they has they have a big couple of cheese there and once when do we visit france they say this taste they have got a variety of cheese there okay so once uh, this the swiss cheese right yes very good students i see uh, shrivatsa and nilambari giving the right answer good so which of the following okay which of the following statement uh, are correct and incorrect good the question is something nice they have asked which is quite different right you are going to choose the correct one you are going to choose the incorrect one a band of the muscle are dark and contain myosin the i bands are light bands and contain actin during muscle contraction the a band contracts the part between the two z line is called a sarcomere the central gap of the thick filament not overlapped by myosin filament is called head zone now when you come into this picture see that i already said like when you pass a polarized light okay you get the alternate uh, dark and light bands probably because of the presence of those thin and thick filaments that is the actin and the myosin and so you get that striated appearance that is why we call the skeletal muscle as the striated muscle now just look into it now the question first option let me explain you the a band of the muscle are dark and contain the myosin okay so the a band of the muscle vand is uh, that is this is the a band okay so it is dark because it has got the myosin yes this is the right option now we we'll let just look into it the i bands the i bands are the light bands and they contain the um, what you call the actin yeah that is a right statement during muscle contraction the a band contracts no so during muscle contraction what is going to happen the a band will remain only the i band will come closer so that is not the right option the part between the two z line is called the sarcomere as yes, this part the successive distance between the two uh, consecutive z line we call as a sarcomere which is a functional unit in a muscle tissue okay then we have the central gap of the thick filament not overlapped by myosin actually it is overlapped by the myosin filament and that is why we call that as the h zone okay so this is a wrong statement so which is the right answer the first second and uh, the fourth are the right option whereas the third and the fifth are the wrong options okay students yes come on nilambari and shri also hmm. yeah this question i think already i have discussed also so the second maturation division of the mammalian ovum occurs shortly after ovulation before the ovum makes entry into the fallopian tube or until the nucleus of the sperm has fused with that of the ovum in the graphian follicle showing the first maturation division after the sperm has been penetrated by the ovum so already i said that oogenesis is starts with the division of oogonia like we have number of oogonia like millions of oogonia which give rise to primary oocyte now this primary oocyte okay now all these oogonia are formed by mitotic division 
Now what happens once uh, one with the oogonia they will divide and they form the primary oocyte. Now this primary oocyte will undergo the meiotic division and it will enter into the prophase 1 of the meiotic division and it gets temporarily arrested at this stage. Now these primary oocyte no, they get surrounded by primary, secondary and tertiary uh, follicle respectively. The tertiary follicle will grow in size and it will complete its first meiotic division to give rise to haploid secondary oocyte. Now, it is not the tertiary follicle, we have what is called the graphene follicle. So, you have to know that every month some 5 or 6 follicles will be outrightly selected. All will tend to grow but only one will mature up which we call it as the graphene follicle and that is the one which will complete the first meiotic division by producing the haploid secondary oocyte. Now, the secondary oocyte now it will form what is called that zona pellucida around it ok so during fertilization the sperm is going to fertilize the uh, like it is going to make an entry into the zona pellucida through that it has to pass through ok now once when it goes here it is completing the second meiotic division that is the secondary oocyte will complete forming unequal two cell one will be the haploid ovum another one will be the second polar body so what is the answer so the second maturation division or the second meiotic division in the mammalian ovum will occur only after the ovum has been penetrated by the sperm okay ma you are able to follow this yes the most significant value of vegetative propagation is that it enables rapid production of genetic variation it is a means of producing a large population of individuals genetically identical to a parent Okay, it ensures that the progeny are safe from the attack of disease and practice. It is an ancient practice. So, what is the most significant? We know it's traditional. We know that it is going to have a rapid production, but it is not going to have any genetic variation being an asexual method. So, vegetative propagation is actually a asexual means of reproduction. Okay, so what is going to happen here? Now, suppose from a part of a plant when you are going to take it up, okay that forms what is called the x plant okay or a fragment now you are going to put it in another so they are going to produce it is uh, just identical to the plant okay so we call that as what it is a clone so it is going to be exactly same as that of the parent so vegetative propagation is a form of asexual reproduction like only one plant is involved like it's uniparental and it is going to produce a progeny which will be exactly having the same copy genetical identical to the parent okay so because the clones are just coming from the original plant there is not going to be any mixing of dna occurs so the most common forms of vegetative uh, propagation like we can have what is called grafting okay layering these are some of the common forms which we would have heard okay or what we are using in tissue culture the suckers the stolons okay in pistia so all these are some of the methods even the bryophyllum okay even all that so there are very good example of um, what do you call uh, the asexual reproduction okay so that you need to know so that you need to know yes so this is with the vegetative reproduction we will go to the next question Yes, so this is the answer which I already explained. So, it produces a large population of individuals which will be genetically identical to the parent. So, that is the right answer. Yes, Neil Ambari, please start posting the answer. In photosynthesis, for fixation of one molecule of glucose, the number of ATP and NADPH2 required is 12 and 18, 18 and 12, 6 and 12, 18 and 18. So, from one molecule of glucose, what is uh, going to be formed? Now, you can see that from one molecule, uh, that is that one molecule of glucose it is going to require six turns of calvin cycle like we'll see here so during photosynthesis one calvin cycle takes in only one carbon at a time so it is six turns of the cycle to produce that glucose okay so for the formation of one molecule of that exo sugar 18 atp and 12 nadph2 are actually used that is 30 atp and 12 nadph are used in c4 cycle so the atp and nadp are what they are the assimilatory powers with the help of the light they will be formed and from this uh, what is going to happen it is going to help in production of starch that you need to know so what is happening with uh, actually here there will go, there is going to be six turns of the cycle now when there is going to be six turns of the cycle okay what is going to happen there it is going to form 
the net molecule that is around 80 in ATP there. But what is happening in the Calvin cycle there totally? We are having around 6 turns and 3 ATP molecules. So, 18 ATP molecules in terms with 1 turn of the Calvin cycle. So, it is 18 and 12. So, that is the answer. Yes, very good Nilambari, you have given the right answer. The force of tension cohesion exceeds uh, root pressure on a rainy day, foggy morning, sunny day, full moon night. So, when you look into that force of tension cohesion, like you can see the cohesion pressure, okay. So, what is going to happen on a sunny day? Yes, there is going to be more transpiration, okay. So, what is how it is going to exceed the root pressure. So, it is the force of tension, whatever is there, is going to exceed the root pressure probably on a sunny day because the rate of transpiration is going to be very, very high on the day, okay. So, that is the right answer. What is true about limbic system? It is a part of the forebrain. The amygdala and hippocampus are part of it. It regulates sexual behavior and emotional reaction, all of this. See, when I, when I talk about limbic system, there are something called a limbic area where it is present exactly below our cerebral hemisphere. We say actually to describe it in a term, like it is like a man sitting on a horse, okay, without those reins. So, it is not under the control. The mind is the one which is putting the horse under the control. That is your cerebral cortex. So, this limbic cortex is something out of our control. Okay, that is why we have those ideas. But those ideas are not favorable. So, they are put under control by our mind which is the cerebral cortex. So, these limbic system actually we have a array of nucleus like we have amygdala, entorhinal uh, cortex, uh, we have the hippocampus. Okay, and then we have uh, what is called the pa part of it uh, will be a portion that is the pyriform cortex, all that has been there. So, they say traditionally like uh, to talk with this limbic system, it is more associated with hypothalamus. So, they say that, that sexual behavior, the emotion, what we have, all that is contributed from the limbic system. Okay, so we can see here, see this is the cerebral cortex. Okay, so this is that amygdala hippocampus. They say like these structures, you no, know, they don't have that what we call that uh, like they are very basic with the development of those emotions and those sexual instinct and all that. So they are put under the thing under the because of the cortex, and they are part of the forebrain only. So it's a part of the forebrain. The amygdala and hippocampus are part of it. It regulates the sexual behavior. So all of these is the right answer. Yes, very good, Nilambari. Next, which of the taxonomic aids can give comprehensive account of complete compiled information of any one genes or uh, family at a particular time? Taxonomic key, flora, herbarium and monograph. Herbarium is different like okay. Okay, we will just see one by one. See, when you look into this taxonomic keys, they are aid for rapid identification of unknown plants. So, when you look for flora, it is an inventory of plants of a defined geographical region. So, you say what is the flora there, the fauna there, it is something like a defined, uh, giving an inventory in a defined geographical region. So, herbarium is nothing but it is a safe uh, way of storing specimens where it provides a suitable atmosphere for the research, like where you compress it, they take those dry uh, the things and then you put it to them like that. But what is a monograph? The monograph is a book or an essay which gives a comprehensive account of all the genes, those information right from the higher category, grouping, everything. So, it is a very highly taxo taxonomic aid. So, a monographic is a comprehensive taxonomic treatment. Okay. So, generally a genus or a family provides all the data relating to that group. Okay. So, the answer is what? It is the monograph. Yes, very good uh, Nilambari. Opening of the hepatopancreatic duct into the duodenum is guarded by pyloric sphincter, sphincter of Boyden, sphincter of Odi, cardiac sphincter. See, just look into it. We have uh, what is called the bile duct, that is we have the common bile duct which is coming up, which will be opened up along with the duct of Versang, the main pancreatic duct in the ample of water, which will be guarded by the sphincter of Odi. So, it was actually discovered after the anatomist, okay, Rugro Odi. So, that is why it is named as sphincter of Odi, okay. The sphincter of Odi is very, very important, okay. So, next, every 100 ml of the deoxygenated uh, blood delivers approximately 4 ml of carbon dioxide to the tissues, 4 ml of carbon dioxide to the alveoli, 5 ml of carbon dioxide to the alveoli, 
5 ml of carbon dioxide to the tissues. So, here you have to be very careful. See, every 100 ml of the deoxygenated blood, it is going to deliver 4 ml of carbon dioxide. So, that is, they say that actually when you take the average, uh, uh, what is that, the saturation with that hemoglobin, what we studied. So, same way when you take and when you minus the saturation with the arterial end and the venous end, we get around 4 ml. So, it is around the 4 ml of carbon dioxide that has been delivered. Okay, every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood will have 4 ml of carbon dioxide. Similarly, every 100 ml of uh, oxygenated blood will deliver 5 ml of oxygen to the tissues. Okay, so that concept you should know. Yes, very good ma. The answer is B, 4 ml of carbon dioxide to the alveoli. Okay, the next question is in sponges, the asexual reproductive structure is endogenous budding, exogenous budding, okay, conidia or zoospore. So, when I say endogenous budding, it is a process where the bud develops inside the parent body. Okay. So, sponges they belong to that porifera, no? So, they have both sexual and asexual mode of reproduction and all that. So, in asexual mode, they have that budding. So, here in the budding, what happens? They form like an outgrowth or a bud, but it will be like uh, what is that? Internal buds. That is what, what we call as gemules and uh, it is going to get. So, after uh, uh, some time, the gemules under favorable condition, they just get separated out and they are going to develop into a new uh, organism. So, the common asexual reproductive structures are conidia, that is penicillin, buds in hydra, gemules, which is the exogenous bud is uh, common in hydra. But the endogenous bud is common in the gemule, the sponges. Okay. So, depending on and uh, zoo spores in fungi. So, depending on the favorable condition, what is going to happen? The gemules which are formed in the thing, they, they will be just then released out. So, the answer is endogenous budding. Yes, very good ma. The precursor of tissue macrophages or lymphocytes, eosinophils, monocytes, none of these. See, when I say... Uh, macrophages it is actually the lymphocytes eosinophil all that is it is the monocyte see monocytes actually it is a type of wbc supposed to be the largest wbc okay it is around some 12 to 18 micrometer in diameter it is a granulocyte so that is produced from the stem cells in the bone marrow so this monocytes will remain in the blood for very short time because they are a weak phagocyte it can phagocyte but not to that great extent so, what happens then it migrates to the other tissues as macrophages moving particularly to those areas invaded by bacteria and other foreign materials and they perform phagocytosis. Now, one thing you should know that these macrophages, okay, they are wandering macrophages. Some macrophages will be fixed, okay, and they have their specific name like how we have QFA cells in the liver, osteoclast in the bone, the dendritic cells in the skin, okay, so like that, okay. The secretions of dash gland helps in lubrication of the penile organ, okay, uh, the prostate gland, the bulbourethral gland, seminal vesicle, none of these. So when you look into the uh, prostate and seminal uh, vesicle, they are the one which is going to add the main content of the semen fluid. But coming on to the lubrication part, it is done by the bulbourethral gland which is called the Cowper's gland which was uh, actually discovered by William Cowper who is an anatomist. Okay, so you can see that P like uh, structure, okay, which is there located there in the near the urethra. So, they contribute to the final volume of the semen and they are the one which is going to help in lubrication and it also helps in neutralizing the acidity of the urethra also. So, that is where it is very important. So, bulbo urethral glands, okay mama. Which of the following is not a function of skeletal system? Storage of minerals, production of body heat locomotion production of erythrocytes so when you look which is not a function storage of minerals yes calcium yes everything is getting stored up there phosphate and all locomotion yes rbc production yes bone marrow so which is not the option yes it is the production of body heat which is not the function it is actually the function of the muscular system okay which element is required for the germination of pollen grains boron calcium chlorine and potassium. So, which element is required? Now, you can see that mostly the micro element particularly they are required in small amounts. So, we see the boron. So, the boron is a micro element which is actually present in the soil in very small amount. So, they are present as boric acid and tetraborate anions. 
Now what is going to happen this boron is required for the germination of those polar grains as well as for the cellular differentiation also. So the right answer is boron. Yes Neelambari please do post your answers. Okay. Okay we will go to the next question. Halophiles differ from eubacteria in the options are having different cell wall and cell membrane structure. Okay. Okay, they survive in extreme conditions, require oxygen for survival, more than one option is correct. Okay, we will see what is that. So, the halophiles uh, are substances like they are named after the Greek word which is called salt loving. Okay, okay, so what are those halophiles? So, they are named after the Greek word salt loving, they are extremophiles, like they thrive in that extreme of uh, salt solution. So, while most of the halophiles they come under this domain archaea. They are bacterial halophiles and some are eukaryotic species like that algae, dalinalia or fungus, valamia. So the right answer more than one option is correct. So, okay. so the halophiles they differ from eubacteria in all the more than one option is correct. So that will be the right answer. Density of population increases with emigration increases, immigration decreases, mortality increases, natality increases. So, when will the population increase? Natality means what? It is the birth rate, right? We all know about it, the number of birth. So, what is going to happen generally when the birth rate is going to increase? Definitely the population will increase, probably by germination or hatching or fission or by childbirth, anything you can take, which is directly proportional to the birth rate. So, density of population is directly proportional to the natality. Yes, very good Nilambari, you are giving the right answer ma. Which of the following statement is uh, regarding the decomposition is false. Warm and moist environment favors decomposition. Decomposition rate is slower if detritus is rich in chitin and ligand. Earthworm is a detriore. Precipitation of soluble inorganic nutrients into the soil horizon as unavailable salt is called mineralization. First you should know that uh, the decomposition it takes part in recycling of the biogeochemicals and creating a space for the newer geochemical of uh, that is availability of that to the organism. So you have three categories the first is the fragmentation okay then we have the catabolism then we have the leaching and then we have the mineralization. So when you look into leaching the part of the water soluble substances which are present in the fragmented or it is coming from the decomposed in detrices they go into the soil where they will be percolated with water and they get precipitated like salt. But what about the mineralization? It is the release of inorganic substances okay, which is released by the saprophytic microbes. So from the organic matter or the humus during the process of decomposition. So we should know that the mineralization actually helps in release of inorganic substances both non-mineral okay, as well as the minerals. The non-mineral like you can say carbon dioxide or minerals like calcium, magnesium, potassium and all. So mineralization is a process by which the humus is further uh, degraded by some microbes to release that organic substances. Okay. So, which among this is the wrong one? The precipitation of soluble inorganic into solid as unavailable salt. So, that is the wrong one. Okay. So, select the wrongly uh, matched pair with regard to C4 cycle. Okay. Primary carbon dioxide fixation PGA product, site of initial carboxylation mesophyll cell, primary carbon dioxide acceptor is PEP, C4 plant maize. So, something they are asking us to pick out the wrong one from C4 cycle. So, in C4 cycle, the first initial carbon dioxide fixation, it occurs in the mesophyll cell. Then the primary acceptor of that polyenol uh, pyruvate, it will combine with carbon dioxide and it is going to form what is uh, in the presence of the PEP carboxylase, okay. And it is going to form the stable compound, the oxaloacetic acid. So, the primary fixation product is not this, whereas it is the oxaloacetic acid. Then this is the one which will enter into the uh, what you call uh, the bundle sheet cell where it is going to help in the formation of the malic acid okay so you can see here see the pep carboxylase helps in the formation of what is this this is the phosphoenol pyruvate it is forming the oxaloacetic acid so this is the first primary carbon dioxide fixation this happens in the mesophyll it enters the bundle sheet where the malic acid is going to be formed 
okay so that is the right uh, the wrong statement with c4 cycle okay the next question the oxidative phosphorylation in eukaryotes occurs during dash light reaction in chloroplast dark reaction in chloroplast anaerobic respiration in mitochondria aerobic respiration in mitochondria so what is oxidative uh, phosphorylation see oxidative phosphorylation is the production of atp okay where, where uh, there is going to be production of atp with the help of uh, energy that has been liberated during oxidation of some reduced uh, coenzyme and terminal oxidation so you can see that in the electron transport chain right so where is this happening so it's an oxidative process that is going to happen in the inner mitochondria of the eukaryotic cell so the process of this atp synthesis whatever you are seeing here is happening in the inner membrane of the mitochondria so it is where in the ec that is the electron transport chain it is called the oxidative phosphorylation or terminal oxidation so it is taking place in the mitochondria okay the most important role of potassium the most important role of potassium uh, ions is that it provides a red color it promotes uh, photosynthesis it influences many enzymatic activities which regulate many plant processes it helps in the formation of cambium see potassium when you take no it has got so much of activator of several enzymes particularly including the dna polymerase so it is going to activate more than 40 enzymes that regulate most of the plant process so it is very much important for activating the enzyme so it influences many enzymatic activities which regulate many plant processes is yes, very good nilambari you are interacting very good which of the following is a copper containing protein that act as a mobile electron carrier in thylakoid membrane plastocyanin plastoquinin pheophytin cytochrome b6 so the copper containing is what it is the plasma uh, that is the plastocyanin which is involved in the electron transfer the plastocyanin actually it functions as a electron transfer agent which is between the electron uh, that is the cytochrome f which is between the cytochrome f to cytochrome b6f okay so uh, which is from the photosystem 2 okay and p700 to photosystem 1 okay so that is where it is very important so here the cytochrome uh, uh, what you call the cytochrome f will act like a electron donor so plastocyanin is a copper containing protein that is involved in electron transfer in photosynthesis it is going to help in transfer of electron from cytochrome f to cytochrome b6f from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1 so this uh, cytochrome b6f and that p700 okay they are both membrane bound proteins which are exposed on the lumen side of the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast so here the cytochrome f will act like a electron donor while p700 will accept the electron from the reduced plastocyanin so the plastocyanin is the answer yes very good nilambari diblast the diploblastic animal with radial symmetry is roundworm earthworm liver fluke and hydra so this form of symmetry is very characteristic of hydra like you can see here which is the radial uh, symmetry so in hydra which are seal and trace they have that ectoderm outer inner endoderm and in between they have the mesoglea which we are aware of it but what about the round worm the round worm is actually they are bilaterally symmetrical okay triploblastic earthworm which is annelid bilaterally symmetrical triploblastic what about liver fluke platyhelminth bilaterally symmetrical triploblastic the hydra is the one which is diploblastic radial symmetry which organism is used as a biocontrol agent of several plant pathogen baclovirus bacillus thuringiens dragon flies and trichoderma so when i was reviewing through these answer the nearest comes with the baclovirus and trichoderma because baclovirus they say it's group of this nucleopolyhedrovirus even they are also good among a biocontrol agent but among them the recent research have proved that it is the trichoderma because it is several plant pathogen they are asking they say that trichoderma it uh, dominate most of the uh, what you call most of the pathogens like uh, pythium fusarium uh, rhizoponia species like that so it is a uh, got a vast variety of uh, biocontrol agent of several plant pathogen so biological control been developed for use in the treatment of plant disease is the fungus trichoderma so the trichoderma species they are free living fungi very common in root ecosystem but they are very effective for several plant pathogens like i said no they are very effective target like with the pythium fusarium etc so those species like like that you can count them on with so many species 
which they have reported. So the answer is trichoderma. Next in the given diagram of antibody X indicates the X here constant region of the heavy region, disulfide bond, antigen binding site and light chain. So when you look into the antibody it is called the immunoglobulin which is a Y shaped structure which has got two light chain and two heavy chains and it has got a region which is called FAB and FC. FC is the portion which will bind to various cells or where it attaches itself to some complement system. The FAB portion which is called the fragment okay it has got a constant region and a variable region it is a portion where it will bind with the antigen. So what is the answer it is the antigen binding site okay so this X portion is the antigen binding site okay the antigen will combine with the antibody they will have a lock and key manner and they will have so that is the answer okay so I think uh, with this we have come to the end of the discussion of the part 2 phase of the biological questions Nilambari good uh, uh, thing you have interacted very well and other students excellent uh, soon uh, I will meet you in another session with very nice interesting detailed biology solutions. Thank you children. Good night.